Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Yonfield Town Council for Tuesday, May 15th, 2018. I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. We did meet in closed session just prior to this for the items uh, listed on our special uh, closed session agenda. Uh, please uh, roll call, uh, Clerk. Councilmember Dorman? Here. Councilmember Moeller? Here. Vice Mayor Doran Becker? Here. Mayor Dunbar? Here. Please let the record reflect that Councilmember Durham is excused. Thank you. And before we move on to the Pledge of Allegiance, I'm sure many, if not all of you, have heard that we lost one of our longtime residents uh, in Yonville, Lee Hart, passed away uh, very recently. And so we'd like to uh, please invite all of you to um, share in a moment of silence in uh, Lee's memory. Thank you, and please uh, keep Christy and uh, Liz and the rest of the family in your thoughts and prayers. Um, Mr. Hall, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Next up, adoption of our agenda for tonight. Is there a motion to adopt? So moved. Second. Michelle, it looks like it might be working. Please vote. Oh, oh. Almost. Almost. Pretty sure that was unanimous. It was unanimous. All right, we're going to go with that. I clicked it before it was ready. All right. All right, we're going to move ahead to our first proclamation for this evening, declaring May 20th through the 26th uh, National Public Works Week. We have a few of our local public works folks here in the audience who would please join me at the podium, and I can present uh, this proclamation. I know it always takes a lot to get you guys in here. But we enjoy it when you do. Come on over here. I'm not as scary as the town manager, so I hope. This recognizes May 2018 as National Public Works Month. Whereas public works services provided in the town of Yountville are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives. And whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of Town of Yonville public works systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, public buildings and solid waste collection. Whereas the health, safety and comfort of the Town of Yonville greatly depends on these facilities and services. Whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design and construction are vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of the Town of Yonville Public Works staff. Whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff the Town of Yonville Public Works Department is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now therefore be it resolved, I, John F. Dunbar, Mayor of the Town of Yonville, do hereby proclaim the week of May 20th through the 26th, 2018, as National Public Works Month. Wait a minute. We're going to do a week and a month. A special week and the entire month. There we go. As the mayor of the town of Yonville, I call upon all of our citizens and civic organizations in the town of Yonville to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Gentlemen, thank you very much. And Joe, Joe back there. Come on up here, Joe. We need you for the photo. Let's turn this way. We've got a photographer back here. If any one of you would like to comment. Uh, without stellar leadership from the council and Steve and Joe, we can't do our job, and we just thank you guys for that. Thank you very much.
Larry, never make a public uh, elected official you talk too short when you get a microphone. <laughs> you don't ramble or anything. Just get to, right to it. Next up, a proclamation recognizing May also as Building and Safety Month. I believe we have Rick. There's Rick. Rick Walters representing us as our building inspector. Please, Rick, if you would come join us. Join me. This is to proclaim May 2018 also as Building Safety Month. Whereas the town of Yountville recognizes that our economic strength, health, and welfare depend on the safety and value of the homes, businesses, and infrastructure that serve our citizens and visitors, both in everyday life and in times of natural disaster. And whereas the town of Yountville historically has proven its commitment to building safety through projects such as the Town Hall Seismic Retrofit Project and others. Whereas our confidence in the structural integrity of the buildings that make up our community is achieved through the, devoted, the devotion of building safety and fire prevention officials, architects, engineers, builders, tradespeople, design professionals, laborers, and others in the construction industry. And whereas these dedicated professionals are members of the International Code Council, a US-based organization that brings together local, state, and federal officials that are experts in the built environment to create and implement the highest quality codes to pr protect us in the buildings where we live, learn, work, worship, and play. Whereas the town of Yountville benefits economically and technologically from using international codes, avoiding the high cost of developing and maintaining widely adopted building safety and fire prevention codes that provide safeguards from natural disasters such as wildfires, floods, and earthquakes. Whereas Building Safety Month 2018 with the theme Building Codes Save Lives is sponsored by the International Code Council to remind the public about the critical roles our community's code officials play to assure us a safe, efficient, and livable environment. Now, therefore, be it resolved, I, John F. Dunbar, as mayor of the town of Yonville, do hereby proclaim the month of May 2018 as Building Safety Month in the town of Yonville. Thank you very much. Sir. There you go. Where is she? Where is she? Now she's over here. She's keeping us guessing. Thank you very much. If you'd like to share any thoughts. Just a few quick words. Over the last 30 years, I've worked in probably 23 jurisdictions, subbing off and on. This is the best one I've ever worked in. Uh, you have a good staff, the citizens are great, um, and you care about the people here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. I'm pretty sure most of this half of the room is here for our next one. Um, and this is a great uh, joy for me and the council as a whole to be able to do this. Sharon, so if you would please join me up here so we can recognize you and the Yountville Sun celebrating your 20th anniversary. Congratulations. I didn't say anything yet. I love you anyway. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this proclamation rec is recognizing Sharon Stensis and Yonfield, the Yonfield Sons' 20th anniversary. Where uh, now? Some of this stuff, I, you know. Well, sure, we made it up. But some of it, you said it, so you can't go back on it now. Whereas Cal State Northridge journalism graduate Sharon Stensis having successfully launched two award-winning small-town newspapers in Colorado, moved to Yountville with her husband, Oscar Rhodes, in January 1998. Whereas Sharon and Oscar fulfilled a dream when they published the first edition of the Yountville Sun on May 14, 1998, from the dining room of their home on Stags, Stags View Lane. Whereas with Oscar as president and advertising director and Sharon serving as editor and publisher, the first edition included contributions from familiar folks, including Lou Jefferson, Eric Housley, Steve Zanatel, and the mysterious Colonel Mustard. Many other local writers and supporters have helped 
to enrich the Outfield Sun experience over the years. Whereas in response to early skeptics who questioned the need for a local paper, Sharon said, the news will make itself, but don't worry, it will be free fish wrap if that's what it's good for. <laughs> you remember that, right? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> Oof. Whereas through floods, earthquakes, fires, blackouts, and other significant breaking news, the Yountville Sun has greeted us consistently every week in our mailboxes, except for one week in March 2013, following the passing of the original paper boy, Oscar Rhodes. Whereas for 20 years, Sharon tirelessly has brought us news, human interest stories, editorials, business updates, and much more that range from the serious to the endearing to the humorous. Sharon earned the respect and devotion of current and former residents, as well as visitors, because she has represented our Yountville community with integrity, compassion, and heartfelt dedication. Whereas Sharon has expressed that she and the Yountville Sun have never wavered from the original mission to provide a free, community-focused newspaper that, another quote, I hope, mirrors Yountville and its surroundings by accurately reflecting its character, conscience, changes, successes, and failures in a timely, objective, intelligent, and sensitive manner. Whereas Sharon was recognized as the 2018 Yountville Chamber of Commerce Small Business of the Year and is our champion, our neighbor, and our friend. Now therefore be it resolved by John F. Dunbar on behalf of the entire Yountville Town Council and community, congratulate you, Sharon Stensis and the Yountville Sun on its 20th anniversary and we offer our best wishes for continued success. So. Thank you very much. Um, as I look around the room, none of you were here 20 years ago. <laughs> I was. I was. Not, not in the seat you're not on Not in now. the seat, right. <laughs> and um, that's a good sign. It's a good sign of a, a vi vital and um, vibrant uh, democracy and um, a well-run town. I think probably the only thing to question is why I'm here 20 years later. Um, you have all new technology, all new ways of doing things, but basically your jobs are very much the same, to listen to people, to make, to, to discuss, to debate, and make decisions, and they're not always easy. I, I've seen that. I've seen some really um, interesting and heartfelt debates in this room. I've seen tears. I've seen laughter. I've seen frustration. I've seen joy. Um, and most of it is, is pretty interesting, and there's sometimes when it's excruciatingly boring. Um, I have to tell you, that just happens. It's, I mean, all of government isn't all that interesting. And um, I remember one night when seated where Sandy Fagan is right now, there was um, a gentleman from the home named Lionel Hovold, and he was here attending the meeting on behalf of the Allied Council. I got a little bit past his bedtime, and he fell asleep and started to snore just a little bit, but it was loud enough to prompt the mayor to ask the person next to him to wake him up. <laughs> And I can say that only that's only happened to me one time while I was watching the meeting at home. Now that you have this technology that allows me to do that. So I try not to let that happen too often. Um, I also want to uh, acknowledge the town staff. Um, you should be very proud, and I know you are, of your town manager and the town staff that he has assembled. They make my job a lot easier because they are so... Um, available and accessible and so honest with me. Um, I work with all of you, um, Michelle and Joe and um, Sandra and Sam, and I don't know Maria that well because she doesn't spend as much money as the others do. She, 
she just kind of gathers and keeps track of it. Um, this has meant a lot to me. Um, this uh, this proclamation and uh, this celebration of 20 years because we've been through. I mean, we've been through a horrific seven months, and so I think it's very important for all of us to find in our own lives the um, milestones and the things that we can be grateful for to help us move forward from where we've been. So thank you again very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, of course. I believe you. <laughs> we always feel your eyes on us, Sharon. Don't worry. Thank you very much for your thoughtful words as well. And there goes our crowd. The good part's over. That's right. Yeah, Sharon has a good excuse. She's going to go home and uh, work on the newspaper. Thank you all very much. Hey, Bill, you can stay. It's like old time. Hey, you going to have people say a few words about Sharon. Bill, say something about Sharon. I will do that. She's, Sharon, don't leave. Get back, Sharon. Get back here. We're going to actually, let's do this. Bill. I don't want to pull rank or anything. No. I, I, Bill, before you start, we're going to move on to our Bill public comment. 65, 64, whatever. Our public is. comment portion of the night. Uh, our first public comment, Bill Dutton. Do I have name and all that stuff? We already got you. We'll find you. You got it. Okay. No, I'd be remiss if I didn't say a few things about Sharon because given those dates, I came to town probably six months before Sharon did. And as you all know, she's a very easy person to get to know, to talk to. And we struck up a, you know, just a nice conversation about things and what have you. And obviously enjoyed reading the paper. And then one day, probably three or four years later after it started, Eric Housley got a hold of me and said, geez, I've been writing a sports section, but the kids are young and this and that. And he said, would you have any interest in doing it? And I said, well, I like sports, but I'm not too good a writer, I tell you that. He said, well, I don't think you have to be with this paper, but no, no. <laughs> he, said that. he said it's on the job training. So in any event, I did it. And uh, I, um, and at the time, as Cher mentioned, there was, you had Lou Jefferson writing this, other people writing things. And I did that. And then obviously, things got a little busy after a while. And I thought, boy, I got to uh, cut back here. So I told Sharon, I said, you know, I, I, I think at the time I was on the council, I was doing a lot of stuff, and I said, I just don't have time for the, you know, right now. Well, that's when I learned out that Sharon had a pretty good way of really hiring people. You had to get your replacement, or else you couldn't leave. <laughs> so I forget who did it, but anyway, I, I, I did. But it was an enjoyable time we had. But one of the things that always impressed me, and it was mentioned here too, is that I think if any one of you look back 20 years, think of something you could do it for 20 years every week and only miss one week. I'm telling you, that is one hell of an achievement. Yeah. That's right. So I don't, th I, I, you know, I, I hope we value what we have because I guarantee you there's not many towns this size that have the, uh, type of paper, the coverage, just the dedication that Sharon has shown for the town and basically passing on the information because without that until these particular technology came along, you know, I can remember sitting out here before the uh, uh, newspaper was around, I'd be the only one in the audience sometimes and I think, well, how does anybody else find out what's going on? Well, word of mouth. So anyway, Sharon, thank you very much. I'm glad I had time to say something. You appreciate it. If anybody else would like to, anybody likes it, yeah. If anybody else would like to speak, uh, we're in public comment anyway, so uh, we'll read about it. Letters to the editor in the Umphil Sun, I'm sure. All right, thank you.
This is our public comment portion, so if there's anyone else who would like to speak on an item not on the agenda, now would be the time. No? Sounds like they're having a good time in the hall. We'll move ahead to our consent calendar then. We have uh, items A through F. Is there any discussion or action on our consent calendar? I move I adoption of the consent calendar. Oh, I already hit. You did. Okay. I'll hit sec. I'll second. Okay. Can I do So that? we have a motion and a second uh, by Moeller and Dorman in one order or another. Okay, moved by Dorman, seconded by Moeller. Uh, please uh, cast your votes when you have the screen come up. Is the screen coming up? Did you go out and come back in? Are you in there? Yes, yeah, it worked the first us. time. Yeah. All in favor of uh, the motion? Aye. Verbally, aye. Any opposed? No? Okay. You think we need to go back out and come back in now for future votes? Because it worked the first time. Are you in an attachment? No, it's up there. It's fine. I just did it manually. Yeah, but we didn't. All right, so we're just going to do a little technology reboot back here. Out. Okay. Leave. Okay. All right. On to, we have no presentations or public hearing, so we're going to move on to item 10A, which is the can limit overview, discussion and direction. Maria? Yes. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Just get this slideshow going okay so um, so the purpose of our of this item before you today is to <clears throat> provide the public um, some overview of what the GAN limit is and some history as it pertains to the town and then share um, some of the options that were crafted with the projections that um, <clears throat> we gathered and working with our consultant um, share the draft ballot language <clears throat> that we already know as of today needs some redacting because with, there's a word limit so we'll be we'll be working on that and then um, just to let you know as mentioned I think in prior meetings that we'll be coming back to you with um, you know the call for the election and the ballot measure um, on or before June 19th <clears throat> so this is uh, an opportunity to provide you with a bit of a primer um, so the GAN limit I sort of I secretly call it like the stepbrother to Prop 13, um, if you think about it that way. <clears throat> so the GAN limit set tax expenditure limits on state and local governments based on 1978-79 tax proceeds. Um, that came under Proposition 4. <clears throat> Subsequent to that, in 1990, Proposition 111 came in, and it increased the limit calculation. So it, it broadened the parameters for how you could calculate your limit. Um, allowing us to use uh, the population of either county or town, whichever one would benefit the municipality best, and then using um, inflation of California per capita income or non-residential new construction assessed valuation. So every year, um, any community that's subject to a GAN limit um, has the flexibility to use this because this new law came into effect. <coughs> so in in theory, really, what is GAN limit? So GAN limit says tax proceeds in excess of the updated calculated limit that is calculated annually, um, but based on 1978, 79, and 1990 may not be appropriated. But then the Constitution says the only exception to that rule is that you can do that if you get a voter-approved override with a maximum of four years. So you can, you can spend more than the limit if you have an override. Um, so there's also some exclusions that the law allows us to include so that we can reduce the proceeds that are counted. And so those include things like interfund transfers, capital outlay, debt service, federally mandated appropriations that have to be spent or restricted on certain things, <coughs> FLSA or FICA Medicare taxes that are paid um, on overtime. So for us, an example of that is what we even though we have contracts for public safety, we can still extrapolate what we pay for those and use those as exclusions. <coughs> so currently, the exclusion for the town um, is about 1.5 million, and the town is not exceeding the limit. Um, in the last published budget document, it was published at 2.2%, <coughs> so under the limit, so we're really close. Uh, we've recently received a new format from the League of Cities, which is really helpful, and it's helped us to call out further our revenue proceeds and so if I recalculate the numbers in today's numbers from the adopted budget we're at six percent but that's still pretty close 
So the current override that the town has was approved in 2014, as I mentioned previously, at $1.5 million. And one thing to remember here is that this was done during a recession, which I really think impacted the projections. And I'll get to that in the next slide. Um, so the town, in the, the override that was approved, it increased the town GAN limit to use all proceeds of taxes. Um, and it allowed the town to use the new limit with the override and in effect receive and allocate. So that's important to know that you can receive, you have permission to receive that and to actually allocate it through the budget, budget process, all collected revenues. And this GAN limit is going to expire on June 30th of 2019. <clears throat> so because we've got an upcoming election, uh, we're here to start the process to get the ballot language drafted and discuss it and put it before you so we can be prepared for the election in 2018. <clears throat> So an appropriations limit override does not have to specify how the excess of, of proceeds of taxes will be used by an agency. The amount of the increase requested can be a dollar amount, which is what we have currently, um, a percentage increase, an unspecified amount tied to an increase of revenue from a specific source, as an example here, that would be TOT, <coughs> or any combination of, of that, of those elements described. <coughs> so this is, for me, this is a slide that kind of helped me understand why I said that um, we approved the 1.5 million override during a recession and why that's meaningful. So for example, if we go even back four years earlier, in 2010, the override was $900,000. <coughs> so 600,000 less than what it is right now. And it provided us at that time, because of the proceeds of revenues that we received, the proceeds of taxes, it, it, we were 25% under the limit. And at that time, the proceeds of taxes were $4.8 million. So we went through this exercise in 2014. During a recession, we probably used very conservative projections and didn't account for all the growth that was going to happen to it, Yauntville, which has been great for our community and our economic vitality. And so we got a 1.5 million override, but now with the growth of proceeds of taxes, we're at 2.2% to 6% under the limit for what is $9.4 million, um, a $4.6 million increase compared to 2010. So that's kind of a, a, what leads me to my next statement, which is I think that it was likely that the proposed override for one, of 1.5 million was just too low, um, given where we are currently. <coughs> The next slide is a slide that's familiar to you. You've seen it. Um, I brought this before you during budget parameters to show you what's happened with TOT. <coughs> um, you can see that the peak growth happened uh, right before um, the next approval, but we probably didn't have those numbers quite yet um, <coughs> for true up purposes. But you can see the amount of growth that we've had. I mean, in 2013, we had $5.6 million, and now we're looking at $7.1 million um, in projections. So that's a, a huge growth in our proceeds of taxes, <coughs> one of the most meaningful ones. <coughs> so why is passing the GAN limit important? Well, the approved override uh, will position the town to receive and allocate the growing TOT revenue through the regular budget process and allow us to forecast for what we really think is going to happen. The absence of the override means that the town will have to reduce its revenues and ultimately because we don't have a practice of having an unbalanced or deficit budget we would have to then also reduce our services or our expenses <coughs> so here's what we know right now and what's important about <coughs> our approach and strategy for how we approve the next GAN limit and how we approach it we know that TOT is continuing to grow but then here's also what we know we know that hotel rates are continuing to go up we know that there's a possibility of a new county TOT tax for housing, which is going to increase those proceeds of taxes, <coughs> irrespective of where they go. <coughs> we know that the future growth in rooms at certain properties that have been in discussion is probably going to happen over the next four years. And then we also know that certain properties have rebranded themselves, and we know, based on all of the TOT reports, that it's the higher room rate that's really causing that growth in TOT. And I've highlighted some of the properties that have helped to that vitality of the town. <coughs> All of them do, but those are the ones that have s had significant changes. <coughs> so when you exceed the limit, so what happens when you are over your limit, if um, excess revenues in a year can be carried over for one year, meaning if you discover that, that you have one more year to carry them over so that you can um, potentially avoid a 
what you call a refund, but it's really a reduction in your revenues um, by f- by checking to see if your following year actually has less proceeds of taxes or through a reduction. Mm. So if a government entity ends a fiscal year having more appropriations subject to the limit than its appropriation limit allows, the entity must return the excess by either returning taxes or fees. And so returning them means reducing your revenues, which in effect is a benefit to those who pay the taxes. In this case, the highest revenue source is the TOT, so there would be a reduction in our TOT rate, potentially. Mm. The effect of this one-year carryover provision is that the amount of the combined appropriation subject to the limit over the two-year period in excess of the combined appropriations um, must be returned. <coughs> as I said, by the reduction of taxes or fees. And so the government entity must return the excess uh, by a revision of tax rates um, or fees schedules within the next two subsequent fiscal years. So technically, you could have a four-year period where you're over or you balance within two years and then two more years after that to um, repair that potentially with things potentially coming up or reducing your revenues. So one thing to keep in mind of what's happened since the last time that an override was approved. First, um, our consultant shared with us based on a survey and his connections regionally and across the state that um, fixed dollar amounts are not really the norm. So we have a $1.5 million fixed override right now and that's not really what agencies are doing any longer. So over the past 10 years, ballot measures have used variable annual growth adjustments based on estimated revenue growth. and this. This sort of makes sense because when I come to you with projections on revenue, I also adjust them based on how they've grown and what's happened. So it would make sense that we would grow a GAN limit um, override in a similar way because it's a revenue projection. So as I've said, most budgets and forecasts are used and adjusted based on inflation and known factors, and so really the GAN limit is no different than that. And that's one, one compelling reason to choose a variable annual growth measurement as opposed to a fixed dollar amount. So in the report that you received, um, there's really two options. One's pretty s- basic. It's a, f- a fixed amount of $4.5 million. Um, and option two, which is the recommended option, which is a $3 million limit annually, but also allowing for the cumulative increases expected to provide um, uh, over the year. And that's expected to provide us about 16.5% under the limit through um, 2021-22. Um, 16.5% based on our projections is still, I think, pretty reasonable, knowing that in 2010 we were at 24%. So um, one of the things that's also included in your report, as I mentioned right at the beginning, is that um, there's some proposed ballot language that we'll be working on. And we want to invite members of the council, (coughs) if they'd like, to help um, craft this language for the ballot measures we prepare. And we know right now that we're a little wordy, so we have to do some redacting. There's a word limit, (coughs) and we'll have to work to to craft that and have it be language that you're comfortable with and that works for everybody. Um, And so at this point, this is an informational report. We're interested in getting your input, um, answering questions. And we plan to return to you on or before the 19th of June um, so that we can um, stay in sync with the um, call of the election and prepare for the ballot measure. Questions? Okay, thank you. Questions of the staff report? <coughs> Councilor Member Mueller. So I think my uh, first question is for Gary. So four years ago is my understanding, so I just want to make sure that I understand this change, that if we went over our GAN limit, uh, then we returned any um, taxes to the state. And no. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Next question. Okay, so uh, I use that as a selling point, and got you know anybody I talk to is like, "What's this all about?" They go, "Oh yeah, we don't want that." So yeah, we're going to approve it. So now it looks like what the we have to do is lower the taxes that we're collecting, and not take the overage and give it to the state. So which part have I got right, and which part have I got wrong? So. It's correct that the town would need to return the excess over the GAN limit, the expenditure limit, by reducing taxes or fee schedules 
insofar as the taxes are counted towards that gain limit. Right. Funds that come from the state are not necessarily counted and could be reduced differently. So No, I, I didn't mean funds coming from the state. It was my mm -hmm. um, understanding back then that, or four years ago, uh, that anything that we did collect over the GAN limit went to the state. We didn't get to keep it. Yeah, that is not correct. The town doesn't get to keep it. No, that was before. Right. It doesn't go back to the state. Okay, so that never was the case. No. Oh, okay. But so it, it was returned to the source of the tax, correct? Correct. So if, if it was $9.5 million and we had an $8 million limit, $1.5 million that was collected from visitors staying in hotels would have to go back to the actual people that paid the tax in the hotels. That's correct. Or so how hotels. do you find them? Well, right, order the hotels. There's practical issues with doing that. And, and, um, or property tax or sales tax, just to be clear. But property tax being such a significantly lower number than TOT and the accumulation of TOT right. and sales tax. Right. So I the could. money would have to be returned, and then you would still have to lower the number for future to not raise over the limit. Right. I think that's a combination of the two things. So the reason I'm asking is um, when we do put this ballot measure, I'm presuming that we will all agree to something like that this evening, uh, will we, uh, I'd also think that we would want to put together uh, a pros and con list and uh, hopefully there will only be the pros and it will be started out the full council is unanimously agreed and I think we I have found it's very clear to put in and very helpful to get our high number of yes votes that we usually do that if you don't agree to this then this money is going to be returned to you know, however we were right in that discussion, because I find that very compelling to people. This is why you want to say yes. Is that our plan to write a, a yes-no argument that's going to go along with the ballot measure? Yes. The, the argument in support, um, when this comes up, typically it would be during when the council calls for an election generally. Okay. And during that process and that resolution, you would also designate who writes the arguments in support or opposition. Right. Okay. And uh, the council can be one in support. But to your point before that, this does not increase revenue, increase taxes, right. or dictate how the council spends the money. It simply gives the council the authority to spend the money should right. that money come in. Well, and the other thing that needs to be clarified because of the sentence you just gave, right. it's critical that the public understands this is not the residents' taxes. And if they say, right. gee, correct. I can vote against this and my taxes right. will go down. That is not the case. It right. has nothing to do with that. And, and then what I'd like to add in that pro that, you know, in addition to that, we have to give it back to the people who gave it to us. Right. So they really understand the consequence of a no vote. Correct. So, so Maria first and then Steve. Thank you. So the only point of clarification here that I would add is that we would be lowering our revenues because we're not allowed to spend them would be lowering them and then we'd be lowering our expenditures which would in effect negatively impact the services that the town provides to its residents and visitors and i just to expand i think that's the most critical thing which is we're really asking for authority to spend the money that the visitor leaves and lowering the rate sounds good but then we're going to have less revenue and you know you're in a current budget and you know while well, we have a budget that's balanced we do not have the capacity to absorb so I think that's the most important thing going forward is that you would have less revenue to budget and spend on the things that the residents would enjoy so it's not a not a favorable situation at all it's a very favorable situation to have this problem that we get more than we have a limit to spend and we have to adjust it up every time because we've generated more visitor tax dollars and right. we have to be allowed and, to spend them. And I think, Mayor, to the point, and Maria shared this, it's also costs rise, rates revenue rise. So part of this is just a natural extrapolation, but we want to remember that you know we have seen a significant rebranding of our hotels and the room rate revenue, so that's resulting in more revenue. Right. We've seen some incremental growth in hotel rooms. We're going to have a conversation later tonight about a possible increase in the TOT for housing programs that still comes in has to be factored in under our GAN limit and we know 
that <coughs> we have the um, French Laundry Garden Hotel has been indicated to be in the back on the stage of the TKRG group's development potential. So, you know, if all of those things happen in the next four year cycle, it's only going to raise the revenue. And I think it's really important. The good news is if all these things happen during the annual budget process, when that revenue comes in, uh, the five of you will have the opportunity in terms of how to allocate and where does that money go into what program. Right. If we don't get it, you can't do that. And I think that's the simplest thing on to try to explain this because otherwise it's... Um, okay. Yeah, Councilor Dorman. Thank you. So a couple of what I think are quick questions. I just want to be clear. Your recommendation is that the accumulation piece of it is on the TOT tax only. That's correct. And uh, because I uh, have not been here that long, am I correct that this is something that our voters have supported in the past because that is what enables us to spend the money yes. from the TOT, the sales tax, the other taxes that we take in? Yes. Thank you. And, and fairly substantially support. Yes, I think 70 75 80, 80, to 85 percent. Yeah. Thank you. Vice Mayor, questions? I just wanted to also clarify, if this is correct, that the property taxes that are charged to the uh, residents, owners, are charged by the county and then we get part of that. Is that correct? Yes. That is correct. Yes, property taxes, it's a complicated formula, but yes, capped at 1%, so, collected through the county, goes to the state, comes back through the county. It's a whole process. So that is not something that we could carve out and say, well, we're not going to. Well, you know. let me, that's actually. This let is me not a you, tax increase uh, of any kind. This, let me give you a quick Reader's, right, Reader's Digest version of your revenue stream. Well, 1.4 million from property tax that all of the residents and businesses pay, just under 1.4 million for sales tax, 7.1 million in TOT. So when you have an allocation of excess, it's not coming from the property tax because if you equalize everything at about 1.4 million, that means the property tax is where the excess. And I just, that's, I mean, we have to be really clear because it's not even close in terms of where the revenue right. stream is coming from. So probably can't say it enough times. This is not a tax increase. Right. So to, it doesn't even matter which kind of tax we're talking about. This is the ability to spend the money that we have gathered in, with existing taxes, the vast majority of it coming from visitors staying in hotels and spending money in businesses and restaurants. And we don't even have the capacity to lower property taxes. Right? No. Correct. No. All right. So any other questions of the staff report? Any members of the audience have a comment on this? Seeing none. Is there any further discussion? I know there are basically two parts. You'd like to hear from us on the, the content of the how do we adjust the limit. If it's not a dollar amount like we've done in years past, you're recommending a combination of dollars and, and tying it to TOT. Then yes. part two is the language. You want some feedback on language in case we have comments on that already. Yes, and um, it, we're also inviting um, council members, we can work offline as a committee to work on the language so that when it comes back to you in June, you've had some council members work on it with staff. Okay, if, if that's but we, we can maybe touch on a couple Absolutely. quick thoughts if they have, yeah. if council has that, but let's talk about the formula itself. Mm -hmm. That's the principal issue we have tonight. Councilmember Dorman, <laughs> thoughts on that? Thank you. Um, I'm in favor of the formula. I think it is very workable and flexible. Um, and then I have some comments on the ballot language, which I'll wait we'll for. We'll do that, that next. Uh, Councilmember Muller? So, so option two is the recommendation yes. for that. I'm in total agreement. Vice Mayor? I'm in total agreement also. Same. Good. So language uh, comments, Councilmember <laughs> Dorman, your thoughts? Uh, I think I'm dovetailing with Councilmember Moeller in that I, I really like the last sentence that says, by approving this appropriation limit, no new taxes are created, nor will any existing tax be increased. I think it's important. However we cut 25 words or how many we have to cut, we leave something very um, clear and concise like that in there. And then I have a comments. That's Mayor Muller. So I, I looked at this and I compared it to what we wrote uh, four years ago and there's uh, I think there's only a few words or mostly in that first sentence if you take those out you're going to reach your limit because I and there's there's specific rules on what counts as a word and all that so we went through all that last year so if you really 
M Michelle can pull that up for you. Mm -hmm. It essentially says the same same thing. I think you've added some stuff in here about vital public services and uh, maybe medical or, or something. But it's just a few extra words in there that were added in for more oomph that, you know, if you take them out and leave in the, the key ones, I think <coughs> you're going to hit that uh, the limit. But make sure... And I'm more than happy to sit down with you, but you, there's some real specific rules about uh, what's a word and what's not a word. Right. Thank Vice you. Mayor, thoughts on the word content at this time? Well, I think it is, um, I don't know whether it is important to point out that, the, that we don't have the capability of lowering property taxes. I don't know whether that should be stated or not, but... I think that that is something that our residents and and uh, property owners are, might be might want clarified. One of the things, if I could, when we look at the letters of, you know, the support, we may need to address some of those elements in the support because, as Council Member Moeller has pointed out, we're already pushing the limits on the initial, and we're going to need to use our. Uh, support right. section and our rebuttal section should there be an opposition piece. So all of those are good pieces. Um, Michelle shared with uh, uh, Gary and I and Maria last election cycles language. So we'll we'll work through all that if that's your direction and then um, work on uh, bringing that back to you at the probably fairly soon because this is this is really important. Uh, to the town, obviously, and you all get that. Yeah, we need to see it at our June 5 meeting. Yeah, uh, very quickly, important. some language. Um, the first sentence, I agree with Councilmember Moeller about there are words that are just unnecessary. Actually, it's all one sentence. That's part of the problem. It's very difficult to read this. Okay. Sometimes a member of the public will read this and think, you're trying to confuse me, and so I'm going to say no because you're trying to confuse me. So this right now, to me, is confusing. Uh, sales tax generated for maybe something like uh, public services infrastructure and public safety programs, something like that. I think you could, that you've cut the number of words in half just in those first two lines. If you have to have the legal uh, language in here about pursuant to Article 13B of the California Constitution, if that's necessary, then it's necessary. If it's not, Sorry, but nobody really cares what article from the Constitution is coming out of. It can be listed again in the argument. I know. I'm, uh, I'm oversimplifying. Um, but again, I'm looking at this from a, from a voter's perspective, not from um, somebody who can read into the, the details so much. And I still think that the actual calculation is a little bit hard to understand as it's written here. We have to assume the voter has not read or heard anything before they look at this. So however it can be achieved, right now, does it mean increase by the amount of $3 million in additional funds each year over a four-year period? That's $3 million a year over four years. If that's what it means, okay. If it's $3 million total to cover four years, or is it $12 million after four years is over? Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. To me, it reads $12 million after four years. Yes. If, it's, if that's right. correct, then that's okay. Cumulative but it's growth. a little bit... Um, gray there um and so the language it's just a little sure legal it's a little financial um and if we can make it a little bit simpler for the for the voter that would be helpful i think gary yeah if i can just add i'd be happy to work with whatever council members yeah. and um the elections official on this the elections code has very specific requirements sure. on how the questions phrased and what needs to be included and how it's included and then of course there will be an impartial analysis drafted by me as well that will go in and sort of explain this in very perhaps not too dry of terms <laughs> well and i also agree that the last sentence is is critical even in this initiative language m expanding on what isn't what is and isn't happening in a in a um argument statement that's fine that's that's appropriate for where that is but um yeah you've, you've heard agreement i guess you need official vote on whether we're going with your recommendation C can i have one more yes Councilman uh, Moore. comment and so when you do the, your impartial analysis uh we have one council member missing but i like to see the language come back and say that the the full council or there was the the council unanimously supported 
and when uh, council member Durham is back if he decides to undo that but I'm going to go with the assumption that he's probably going to support this I think that's gonna be a very powerful opening statement for our citizens to see that the council is in full support of this so well and also recognizing historically this has been supported by the councils over the last several elections and by the residents at a very high point yeah. If we can include that yeah, historical think, information. Yeah, I think that information would be included in the argument in support. Right. right. That would be drafted by the council and the authors that right. the council designates. And the resolution that calls the election and places this on the ballot, this language will come up again in that resolution for discussion. And then at that point, the authors of the argument in support will be designated. Great. Thank you. Do you need a formal vote, Michelle, or is direction? Yeah. It's a direction I, item. Direction is what we're asking It has been for. given, I think, yes, correct? So, that's okay. so consensus direction to and proceed with option two as presented. accepting the staff recommendation yes. and language will yes. be uh, brought back uh, June 5 right thank you and as I understand it council member Durham will be here at the meeting you would be taking action on the ballot so it will be a fair statement that the council unanimously supports right great thank you great. thank you Let's move on to 10 B thank you Maria 10 B sure. measure a maintenance funding agreement Welcome, Good, Joe. Thank you, Mayor. Members of the Council, tonight we have for your consideration adoption of a resolution to approve Amendment Number 1 to the Napa County Flood Control uh, Protection Watershed Improvement Authority, the Joint Powers Agreement uh, regarding the use and equitable distribution of flood protection sales tax revenues, uh, Measure A funding agreement. Uh, and I thought I would take this opportunity to give a bit of an update on uh, on what we did, how it's been performing, and what to expect uh, going forward. So uh, the, the the main goals for uh, Measure A, uh, use of the Measure A funds for the town of Yountville uh, at the inception of uh, the Measure A program was to protect the town's mobile home parks and surrounding areas, Hopper Creek, Villaggio Channel, Beard Ditch uh, improvements and restoration uh, for flood protection. Uh, this was a picture of uh, the 2005 flood in December. Um, that is the Napa River that is impacting the Rancho de Napa Mobile Home Park. Uh, it came within a couple of feet of, uh, of the top of the wall. Um, and that, uh, in years past, would have flooded the park prior to the flood wall being uh, constructed. For, for those of you who have been here long enough to remember those, uh, those days, it was, uh, seemed like a normal occurrence. Um, whenever uh, the rain uh, got to this level. Uh, the flood was constructed in 2005. It was financed with a combination of town funds, grant money, uh, and ultimately uh, refinanced and then paid off with Measure A funds. Uh, we also uh, performed some uh, uh, flood studies, water modeling, flow modeling, and on Hopper Creek, Villaggio Channel, and Beard Ditch, which had... Uh, also been impacted by some of this uh, flooding uh, from Hopper Creek. This is a kind of a typical uh, heavy rain period on Mulberry Street. Uh, similar conditions on Heather Street, all been impacted by Hopper Creek when it overflows its banks. Uh, flooding on Oak Circle. So these streets were made to uh, carry this water in the course of a 10-year flood, which is a, a, a rain event, which is a, a event that could happen, uh, in theory, once every 10 years. So um, pretty much an average rain for the most part, uh, or what we have experienced as average rain. Um, didn't cause an awful lot of damage, but it definitely caused inconvenience and in, uh, what is described as nuisance flooding. So left uh, a bit of a mess, took a few days to clean up, uh, some muddy streets, uh, people were either stuck in their homes or um, uh, stuck outside of their homes waiting for the water to go down. So it would, it, as fast as it, it comes up, it goes down, but it does require some patience when you're in one of those two modes. Uh, the Fennell storm drain, which we installed as a part of the Measure A project, uh, has an intake structure uh, on Fennell just behind the ball fields uh, at Hopper Creek here, uh, just out, outside of Town Hall. 
It runs down uh, Fennell Street with three 36-inch storm drains to so an outfall structure on Beard Ditch. Uh, this is a, a picture of the drainage structure which sits just underneath the pedestrian bridge during dry uh, times. This is uh, how much water uh, is uh, taken in by that intake structure uh, as the rain begins to accumulate and Hopper Creek begins to reach capacity. Uh, we also had two sedimentation basins. Uh, this one is at Oak Circle and Heather. Uh, there was also one uh, more to the north of this uh, particular sedimentation basin on Heather. Uh, the purpose of these two was to, to gather the sediment, the rocks and gravel uh, that accumulate uh, both downstream and also along both these stretches, which would reduce the capacity of Hopper Creek and cause even more nuisance flooding with even less rain. Um, we have found through our, um, our uh, past couple years after this structures have been installed that it actually helped reduce some of the nuisance flooding. Uh, not all of it, but uh, for sure, um, most notable, uh, Mulberry, uh, even though we had quite uh, a bit of rain last year, um, Mulberry didn't suffer the same kind of nuisance flooding that we would have expected prior to the installation of these flood control structures. Uh, certainly, Oak Circle uh, flooded, but it was less, uh, less noticeable than in years past prior to the installation of those uh, three 36-inch storm drains. Um, and we're continuing to try to uh, make improvements on Oak Circle. Part of the uh, challenge with Oak Circle is that they have some um, flat surface area drains that um, are prone to collecting leaves and debris. And when they do, they just don't drain. So uh, we have let a contract to put in a traditional open mouth uh, curb inlet. So we think that that will, uh, if not completely eliminate, certainly reduce uh, the flooding that most people who live or, or uh, travel on Oak Circle during heavy rain uh, periods are used to seeing. So uh, it remains to be seen what that's going to do. We're hopeful that it's going to uh, eliminate it, um, but we're going to keep working towards getting that street um, to be able to be used, uh, whatever the condition, um, unless it gets really extreme. Uh, and this is a picture of Mallard Cove. Uh, the crews put up a couple of signs uh, and, and, and put a couple of uh, names on them so we could kind of figure out what the sedimentation basins were and what each of us were talking about. And as you can see, it's now kind of home. Uh, even right now, I noticed uh, this weekend, there's still a couple of ducks in whatever little water's left. So it has become habitat. Uh, the, the foliage that you see around uh, both of those sedimentation basins are, uh, are native species, so um, landscape architects uh, weighed in and helped us put some vegetation in there that's native to this area, and there has been quite, uh, uh, it's, it's been quite nice to see uh, the ducks and, and other uh, species kind of start to habitat, have habitat in there. Um, so what comes next? So with this uh, resolution that you have before you, um, you get to decide uh, that we're going to hopefully approve the, uh, the amendment before you because Measure A sunsets June of 2018. Uh, at, at that point, with this uh, agreement, the remaining funds will be dispersed. Uh, it's estimated to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about $270,000. Um, that's after all of our bills for these projects have been uh, complete. Um, it's, I think it's important to note that the flood wall, last payment in the flood wall, I believe, was Febu February of uh, of this year. So that bond has been settled. Um, the the funds will be allocated to the Measure A maintenance fund, uh, where we will leave them until we need to withdraw them for expenditures for Measure A related projects uh, should they occur. With that, I'm happy to answer any comments or questions you may have. Okay, Vice Mayor. Uh, yes, Joe, I'd like to find out have, um, when do you propose that the Oak Circle um, mitigation will take place? Is that is that on the books? Is that something that's... Yeah, we have a contract let. The contractor is waiting on the catch basins, and uh, we expect them to start any day. And then in the future, is that uh, area and the other uh, catch pool or whatever you call it, are they going to be... Um, dredged 
Yeah, we have an agreement. Uh, the council approved an agreement that we have with uh, with flood control, and they are able to um, remove the sediment. Uh, the problem for town staff and and small agencies in general is the routine maintenance agreement that we used to get as just a part of ordinary business from Fish and Wildlife was becoming um, difficult and 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 almost impossible to obtain. It was it's it. it the, the hurdles and the obstacles that uh, a small agency has to jump through and the and the kinds of funds that they have to expend for a three-year routine maintenance agreement we weren't able to to secure them uh, in a timely enough manner that we could remove the sediment and we don't have for us it's a lot of sediment it's a couple of hundred yards of, of sediment for the county their permit allows them to remove thousands of yards so it, it's not much for them it made sense for us to uh, get an agreement with them and so they come and remove the sediment um, on a semi-annual basis it depends on how much drops oh, but um, we discuss it with them uh, the they is. are very um, much more well versed in in um, what the um, stormwater regional quality control board will allow and what fish and wildlife uh, would prefer and and we tend to go with their um, advice okay. thank you mm -hmm. that was addressed uh, today at our flood control meeting as well and I was going to report on that later but um, cost and permitting process has become so uh, difficult and expensive that there are many um, program opportunities through flood control that are being underutilized because property owners are saying we can't put the energy and money into the permitting process and so things aren't getting done and so that would be an example of where we have this agreement we could take advantage of the availability of the flood control in the county uh, to provide the service for us a variety of yeah. services mayor that's a great point um, even something routine like uh, a removing some of the ve vegetation along the sides of the ditches seems like a, a, a routine matter that any um, capable staff member would be able to perform but that requires a permit and and some knowledge and and because the flood control has the staff and the knowledge it really works well for us to have them under agreement so that we can call them they can give us advice on what they want to do what they should do and what they can do and then we uh, help figure out a way to get that done but it works really well for us okay. we wouldn't be able to do it without them yeah other questions two other things just to make sure that what you know and what I heard today matches one is uh, the oversight continues so if we have some of that 270,000 available over some months or even years the oversight is continues it needs to be reviewed what projects qualify but also regular audits would still be required bookkeeping basically would be, uh, continue and there's no no expiration of spending the funds except the um, county um, auditor who would like to have the books closed sooner than later that's kind of what's driving the timeliness of it they'd like this to to be settled in some period of uh, near term so I'm sure you've got more projects that could use that two hundred seventy one thousand dollars actually uh, that's a great segue and I want to bring you home on that because by the adoption of the resolution we're being clear we can only use this for maintenance of the projects that we've already done and that's why Joe gave you a nice snapshot. but I brought up the example that we literally saw just recently which was earthquake damage to the flood wall which was not necessarily maintenance ah, but, but that want, type of thing but could he, still qualify correct, but, in the very narrow but uh, the criteria answer, of measure a yes mayor what I would say on that is we are benchmarking all of the eligible expenditures to those approved measure right. a project the flood wall being one of those projects so any maintenance repair to the flood wall would be eligible the ongoing sediment removal that we created because the sediment basin is not a one-time thing so that's why i'm saying it it can't be for a new project it can be for the maintenance of one of the uh, projects that was approved during the duration so your example of the flood wall is perfectly appropriate and it's identified you have a resolution that identifies our projects and that 271,000 plus or minus will be something that we'll be able to draw down as the public works director said for future repair and maintenance right. yeah, I think it's important to note that it will be instead of using general fund 
because that need would need to be funded in some form or fashion it's actually uh, kind of nice that we have a little bit of money to start with uh, to draw down from so that as the mayor noted should repairs or when repairs become necessary we have a bit of a fund balance to start drawing that down so um, it, it, it actually worked out very well for us right any members of the public have any comments on this seeing none um, we do have a resolution before us is there any further discussion or action to be had on this item like Member, or vice mayor go ahead vice mayor make a motion that we approve um, measure 18-1702 measure a maintenance funding agreement um, resolution number 18-3488 approving amendment one to the Napa County flood protection and watershed Impro improvement authority joint powers agreement JPA regarding the use and equitable distribution of flood protection sales tax revenues measure a maintenance funding agreement is there a second second uh, so Michelle the the um, 10 a is still lit on the agenda I'm not sure if that's why I can't see the voting it, m on mine measure a is let's try that again so and my motion button still it looks like nobody hit the motion or the second they did <coughs> okay well is, can all we right. just say is all this in favor aye and aye okay all four eyes that passes unanimously so that we're still having glitches is bottom line yeah I'm, yeah. I'm making note of it I'm thank you mayor thank you council thank you Joe so I went out and rejoined and came back and then the screen showed up okay. oh, sure. were you in an attachment um, nope. for just now when the vote started was, nope I was in the, the you're in the main staff report area correct okay thank and you. I went out of that and I went to the main agenda and it still didn't show up until I left the meeting and came back thank you I just rejoined so you know so now I see that um, we're moving on to item 10 C and I've highlighted the go. item is it all highlighted on all yes iPads? it did uh -huh. thank you 10 C which is email addresses for members of the town boards and commissions yes thank you mayor uh, this item before you is formalization of the town's uh, public records act response procedures and electronic document retention policies and it also includes authorizing town staff to issue um, at yville.com email address to our board and commission members um, this uh, resolution um, addresses text messages social media and voicemails and those are considered records not kept in the ordinary course of business it does not include emails which are addressed separately in the town's personnel rules and policies um, these uh, text messages well as a result this has to do with the um, Santa, city of San Jose Superior, Supreme Court case about Pro public records act requests and people's personal devices being subject to those requests and it's based on the fact that if, if a board member or council member is discussing town business on the, from their personal device then that is subject to the PRA so to avoid uh, people's personal accounts being addressed we are um, asking to have um, the at yville.com email address um, provided um, the town attorney and HR have worked closely together on uh, making sure this language um, is consistent with the personnel rules and procedures um, I've also worked with IT to find out the cost of adding these individuals um, to our town email so it's um, fourteen dollars per person per month this would be for our ZDRB members our PRAC members and our arts members and then those Yonville representatives on county boards are commissions as uh, needed or determined by the town manager um, so with that the cost for that the annual cost for that is four thousand thirty two dollars to add them to that um, and then um, in addition if council approves this item we would um, all work together with department heads that are staff liaisons to the board and commissions to roll this out in an orderly way give them literature or some training on that and that concludes my staff report you say in the report 24 total new accounts basically yes and did we get feedback from any of the board or commission members on their thoughts about this um, we did not bring it to them 
that I'm aware of. Okay. This is basically to protect their privacy. Yes, it is. And separate official town business from personal right. business. What I would say, when we have had brief conversations, and I'll, yeah, many of them are supportive of the idea and they understand it, even though they initially acknowledged it, there will be a transition from using you know, their current email to this. But one of the things that will help is we will send out all of our stuff to them using the new email. So that will help to reinforce that. Right. Thank you. Uh, questions of the staff report from council? Any? Any members of the public? I'm going to keep asking you until you come up and say something. Um, okay. Any further discussion or is there action? Uh, I move adoption of resolution number 18-3489, adopting the, quote, Town of Yauntville, California Public Records Act response procedures and electronic document retention policy, close quote, and authorizing at yville.com email addresses for members of town boards and commissions and other authorized persons. <laughs> And is there a second? A second. We seem to still be here. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, so that passes unanimously. Still having some glitches, Michelle. Thank you. I'm not seeing the voting. Okay, moving on to cannabis questionnaire results. Sandra. Good evening. Tonight I'd like to share you share with you the results of the community cannabis survey. And before I do so, I want to share some of the town's actions with regards to cannabis um, that were really in response to state law where the, where the state would begin licensing uh, permits for cannabis businesses at the, at the beginning of this year. So in late 2017, the town adopted an amended cannabis ordinance and it generally prohibited all cannabis activity in businesses with two exceptions for personal indoor grows and deliveries. And I'll go into a little more detail um, in a bit. And then in February, the cannabis ad hoc committee that was is comprised of members Dorman and Dur Durham on the council organized and hosted a cannabis workshop at the community center and there were members of the cannabis industry on that panel, including um, dispensary owners and private security and the Napa County Health Officer. There were about 100 um, people in attendance at that meeting, and we heard a variety of viewpoints on whether cannabis should or shouldn't be permitted within this community. So as a result of that meeting, um, and at the direction of the ad hoc committee, staff prepared the questionnaire that is in your packet tonight. And that uh, questionnaire was released online to the public for three weeks in April. And at the conclusion of that questionnaire, we received 209 responses, which really represents a significant response rate, especially for um, surveys in town based on our um, past surveys. And so now I'd like to share with you some of those results. And as I mentioned, the current cannabis ordinance permits personal indoor grows. And what that means is a grow that is within indoors of a personal residence being a detached dwelling. And that personal grow is allowed with some restrictions on to where and how it can be grown. Uh, but we don't allow outdoor grows. And so what we learned from the community as part of the survey is that 48% of respondents would like to limit personal grows to indoors only, while 39% of those were open to allowing outdoor grows. Um, with regard to outdoor grows, 50, as in I, and I mentioned that that applies to the personal um, outdoor grows are prohibited, but it also um, applies to commercial cultivation outdoors. So when we're discussing personal outdoor cultivation, 50% of the respondents did not want to see that occur outdoors, while 60% of the respondents did not want to see um, outdoor cultivation for commercial purposes in the agricultural zoning districts. Um, the town's current ordinance does not permit dispensaries, and that includes both recreational and medicinal dispensaries. And the results of the survey revealed that 
59% of the respondents did not want to see a recreational dispensary in town, while 34% would allow it. And with regard to medical dispensaries, 51% of the respondents were opposed to a medical dispensary, while 45% would allow it. And then I mentioned the town does allow delivery of cannabis within the town limits, and that's pursuant to an approved delivery application and a business license. And 61% of the respondents agreed that delivery should be allowed within the town limits. Um, and so that is a brief description of the nine direct questions um, that were asked in the survey, the survey also included um, some open-ended questions as to um, share other thoughts or comments, and we received 105 individual responses there, and we received 30 responses um, for individuals that had indicated they need more information and they um, better explained what more they would need. So each of those individual responses is also in your packet, and now the council is free to discuss anything about the survey or ask questions of me if you have them. Well, since we only have one of two of our ad hoc members here, I don't mean to put you on the spot about this, but are there um, plans that you're aware of for that two by six uh, to continue discussion to find out how other ju jurisdictions are in the county are, are behaving with this? There are no plans at this time when we had our last meeting, which has been some time ago. Um, we left it that as things sort of unfolded and some jurisdictions made final decisions, especially if they did allow uh, recreational, adult recreational or um, medical dispensaries, uh, that we would maybe reconvene, but not at this time. Okay. So any specific questions of the report before I ask public input and discussion, Vice Mayor? Um, just one. I wanted to make sure that uh, my understanding is that the state law says that delivery and indoor grows are legal is that correct indoor grows are permitted and the town cannot prohibit those right the town could prohibit deliveries um, to be made within the town limits but our ordinance specifically allows them thank you so the only okay. the only thing that's really state mandated is six plants can be grown at home indoors that's and the correct. rest of it is discretionary at the local jurisdiction, basically. That's correct. The only other thing that the town council can't prohibit is the transportation through town. So you can prohibit it ending in town limits, just not transporting it through the town. Okay. Any other questions, clarification? One question I had, you mentioned something about the uh, language in your question about indoor grows and people indoor versus outdoor. You gave us the numbers about... Um, the thoughts on that when you say a single detached dwelling we're seeing accessory dwelling units and we're seeing conversions of garages that might be detached or all those qualifying as individual dwelling units and therefore a property could have two or three dwelling units on one parcel and each would qualify mm, I'd have to go look at the language Gary do you know off the top of your head yeah so I think it, it's per dwelling yes it is it's per dwelling so, so if you have a th you have a three bedroom house and a garage converted to a one bedroom studio and a unit above that garage that's state mandated to be allowed as an accessory dwelling and you have three potentially on one property potentially and each could grow six plants yes provided that they are in fact inhabited by separate individuals or se so the way the prop 64 was written is that it's six plants per dwelling regardless of the number of people living there so yes if they are separate dwelling units then yes In that's just something that we need to pay attention to as we actually craft our ordinance or if we modify it for that reality because we have the new adu mandate for housing and the ability to convert it's going to definitely impact us with the relatively small right. lot sizes we have in Yonville. And I think, Mayor, based on that, it would really, there in order for an ADU to qualify, it would need to be a separately and distinctively rented unit so that it's distinct from that of the property. So there are some elements that we can work on, but that's one clear delineation that would come out of that. And the, the, there may be this qualification in the ordinance as it's written in, in multifamily properties, which really speaks to apartments. The units have to be detached, so the 
cottages on Mount may be able to um, grow within the five individual residences, but not at an apartment where there are shared walls. Um, that could affect a um, primary dwelling with an ADU where they're attached because it's not a separate dwelling per how it's written. Mm. Yeah, we're just going to have to pay attention to that because as people are responding, the can, you know the circumstances have changed even since 64 was enacted, like the ADU situation. So we'll just have to pay attention to that as we go forward. Mm -hmm. and, and Other yeah. things that the ordinance does is it um, you cannot um, take a garage that's used. You cannot take a garage out of commission that's used as a garage. Uh, you cannot um, take elements of a dwelling away that would make it a dwelling, so you couldn't take the restroom in a small ADU or convert a portion of the kitchen. Um, and ADUs are already very small, at generally about 300 square feet. So 50 square feet would eat a, into a lot of that. It will be hard to manage, though, because we don't have a permit requirement. I know we're really just talking about the results of this right now. So just but interesting points. Yeah. And if we are I, amending our ADU ordinance. Right. Especially. Yeah. And if I could, we anticipate bringing our ad hoc committee back for a wrap-up discussion and a determination if there's any proposed actions or changes and or if it, based on the current outcome in their work plan, if the ad hoc committee duration has matured and no longer needs to be an ad hoc committee. Right. Thanks. Did I find the topic where anyone in the audience is prepared to say anything? I'm still, <laughs> still hopeful. Uh, further discussion or action by the council? Um, I, I just wanted to comment that there's a lot of similarities with what uh, happened in American Canyon here in terms of the, the voter approval of uh, legalizing cannabis, but yet when they sent out the survey, they, they found the same results that we found here, that they uh, didn't support it in, in the same numbers in a, in a positive direction that they did uh, when they actually voted for the bill. So uh, there, there's a lot of consistencies. I don't know whether it's a Napa County thing, but it's interesting. You aren't looking for official vote. You, you're hearing direction. It's all, all you need, right, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Dorman. Thank you. And I would just like to say um, to our residents and our council, thank you. This was, I think, a really good process. And thank you, council, for handling it this way. Residents, thank you for coming out, for showing up. Um, I think it's a really good result because it was a vigorous seminar and um, it was a vigorous workshop. And I, um, I think the uh, percentages speak a lot about what we want and uh, look forward to as a community. So thank you to all. Any further comment? Vice Mayor? Um, I was struck when I was reading the, the written comments from the residents who did respond, how they seemed to really be in tune with what we had already put into the um, ordinance that we passed, mostly. So I think that, you know, there were some you know that were more critical or less critical and we were called idiots in some ways but I think it was very similar to the way we had all discussed it and come to the conclusion that you know we, well, we couldn't not allow indoor grows but we felt that the medical um, that allowing deliveries to people who truly need medical marijuana was a was a justification for that so that's that's all I want to say thank you yeah I don't think these are surprising I think what's great to see is the volume of respondents was great but I think this is also pretty consistent to what we've been talking about and, con and hearing we took a very I'd say conservative approach uh, when we had to respond to the proposition when it was enacted in January and we're still open-minded but we this is going to really be helpful as we go forward so thank you for that, Sandra. Thank you. Moving ahead now to item 10E, a countywide working group has been requested to evaluate a 1% transient occupancy tax ballot measure for workforce housing. And let's see. Very briefly, Mayor Council, as you may recall, Visit Napa Valley uh, staff during public comments presented that they were being involved with a regional effort and meeting with all of the uh, jurisdictions in Napa County, the cities and the county to look at moving forward with a 
regional effort to increase the TOT um, by 1% and to earmark, so it'd be a special tax earmarked for uh, regional housing, workforce housing programs and related efforts. Um, the model is premised on something that the voters in the city of Healdsburg recently passed, similar issues that we face here in Napa County, and almost, excuse me, also premised on the fact that the city of Calistoga has been evaluating and working on this, and the consensus direction was that maybe a regional approach would be a better way than everybody going individually. The action before you tonight is simply, is rather simple. It's one, do we want to continue to discuss and potentially participate in a regional effort? And if so, we've been requested to appoint the mayor, one additional council member, and a staff person to participate in the uh, committee to develop and refine some of the concepts and language. Very similar to what we discussed in the GAN limit, the timeliness is of the urgence because to place the ballot initiative on the November ballot, the timeline would require uh, moving fairly quickly for local jurisdictions and the county uh, sometime in the late June to early July time period. So that's, uh, unless you have questions, it's really at this point, do we want to continue and be part of the dialogue? And if so, appoint the mayor and an additional council member. Happy to answer any questions. And and I'll, I'll add some, just in case it helps with questions. I have spoken to the other mayors and a supervisor, um, and we feel, like, and, and then we're all going to go back to our jurisdictions to discuss it. Some of the other jurisdictions already have two council members that represent their housing fund and housing issues that they were going to be uh, appointing. Um, there has been strong, um, a strong positive response from our lodging partners here in town. This was brought up at the um, Tourism Improvement District Board meeting. I know we do have a representative from Visit Napa Valley here. I, I did want to give credit to Visit Napa Valley, who basically is our leader in the tourist industry realm throughout Napa County, and f for them to be you know, basically moving this uh, concept forward, recognizing the need for workforce housing and to work to be working with all the jurisdictions to find a new source of revenue for workforce housing. Um, I, I just want to commend that effort and um, recognize it. Uh, the agreement uh, in the discussions that I've had is that um, more than 1% would not be received well by the lodging and other stakeholders. Uh, there was a lot of discussion leading up to the recommendation for that 1%, but it would generate, I think we said for Yountville, somewhere between six hundred and eighty dollars and $700,000 estimated where new money that comes from the visitors in our hotels, it's not a new tax for our residents, it would be added on to the hotel visitor stay and they would be paying into workforce housing. It would not be limited to hotel workers. It's illegal to designate a single group like that, but it would be workforce housing um, specific to Yountville and in partnership with the entire county. The other thing I just would uh, mention, say we get $700,000 here in town and we don't have the space to build new housing. Uh, this could go toward the conversations we've had about um, maintaining deed restricted homes mm -hmm. and purchase one or two homes, but it could also mean we could partner with another jurisdiction who does have space and the resources to build workforce housing, and we could buy into some of those units and get credit for so, some of those units in our regional uh, assessment needs. So we, those are the types of topics that this committee would be discussing, figuring out how, what types of programs would qualify, how would we be spending money that's generated by the, the vis visitors in the uh, in the lodging. So a little bit more background. Uh, any other questions of staff board? Councilmember Dorman? I just want to piggyback on something you said, Mayor, that and, and clarify, there would be no new, this is not a tax on our residents. This is, uh, the lodging is going to put a 1% tax. 
I just want to clarify, uh, Council Member Dorman, if a resident of Yountville stayed Sorry. in a Yountville yes. hotel, then they would pay Unless it. Unless they sleep over. A, <laughs> yes, but in a general theme, no, it's a, it's a tax that will be paid by the visitor. And the same in all communities. I think it's also important that it's, it's viewed as a regional issue and a regional solution. And also by all jurisdictions raising the TOT, it doesn't create uh, a situation where somebody is perceived to be a less uh, a value by having a lower rate. So it's a kind of a regional effort, and, and and that's something that Napa County has done well in a number of areas. So I think the the storyline. I don't think there's any argument about the need for workforce housing, because we have a lot of folks that would prefer to. Um, live closer to where they work if we had appropriate housing for them to either rent or move into. Well, and one other topic that came up because I brought it up was the desire for us to bring in more families, specifically in Yountville, workforce families that might have children that could be uh, enrolled at Yountville Elementary School. We've been talking about that for years now, and so this would be um, a new opportunity for us in that, yeah, that regard as well. Each community will have some different nuances, but the reality is each community in Napa County has a workforce housing shortage. Right. Any members of the public? Come on, Kathy, you, come on, you came, came all this way. I'm trying to get somebody in the audience to share with us tonight. All right, thank you. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I'm Catherine Haywood with Visit Napa Valley, and I would just like to publicly thank all of you for engaging in this discussion. Um, it's been a long time coming, and we want to just offer our continued support of this effort. Anything we can do to facilitate, um, answer questions, be a resource, we're happy to do so. And as Steve said, and, and Mayor, the, the lodging industry is behind this. It's our board of directors that has taken some nudging, but uh, we're all on board. So very excited. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay. Any further discussion by council? Councilmember Dorman. Thank you. Um, so I'd just like to say I, um, I think this is a great idea to pursue this committee and see where we go. I like it a lot that it's a re regional effort. Um, I think it can have a really outsized uh, benefit for Yontville in that we do have a high TOT. We lack space. We have dollars. I like the partnering aspect of it. Um, I think it dovetails nicely with our general plan as we look for places to put affordable housing. Um, I think it just hits a number of boxes for us. And um, I would be happy to volunteer when the time comes for the committee. I think, well, I know that my background is I have drafted legislation. I've negotiated the kind of agreements I think will come out of this. I've worked on ballot language. Um, so I would be happy to volunteer my services for this. It's like you would make my participation much easier. That sounds very attractive. Councilmember Mueller? Um, I just um, like to say that you know I certainly support this in, in concept. There's, uh, I don't really have a lot of background on what provisions have been thought about yet. I think that uh, this discussion should definitely continue, and I'd be very supportive of uh, Councilmember Dorman's uh, interest in this. And... Uh, my concern when you do talk is I, I think we've got one shot at this and we've got a very short timeline. So um, I would just hope that uh, the mayor, whoever we do appoint, you know, it's, uh, you know, if, if, if we need more time, I, I'm fine with that. If we can't make this ballot and we, everybody agrees and there's a lot of stuff to work out because we still have to get, uh, do a lot of uh, homework to get our citizens to support this. So there's a lot of little steps uh, to go. So that's my only thought is that let's make sure we get it right. And if it does take more time, I'm okay with that. But if you really think you can, everybody can really work out the, the, all the details in a short amount of time, then yeah, and that we'll see how that goes. That conversation definitely, or that topic definitely came up in conversation with the, with the other mayors and the supervisor. That um, this takes a two thirds vote right. of the people right. in each of the jurisdictions, and that's why messaging and clarifying that this is a visitor uh, tax, not a resident tax. That this goes specifically to 
the crisis we're seeing throughout the county in workforce housing uh, at different levels, right. not just low, low or medium, but wherever that workforce housing need is greatest and the most unmet, um, very specifically concentrated on workforce housing, the programming still to be determined, but must be related. So this can't go into other uh, projects that other jurisdictions find of interest. We feel like this, we're recognizing housing is so hard to afford for so many people and that part of the congestion we see on our roads is because we have employees coming from three hours away um, <laughs> to come to work here in the valley. And so we're trying to uh, make a dent in that, in that issue. Because I, I think you really need to work out and be willing or we very importantly have to sell workforce housing we all I think can get behind that but as we know we can't restrict it to workforce housing so how is that really how, how are we going to really accomplish that I think th those are really hard challenging questions uh, also I think you know, there should be some debate about a sunset clause you know should it be done should it be in perpetuity you know you never know. Maybe someday we'll actually, you know, meet those demands because cars won't be an issue. Who knows? So, um, but best of luck to uh, whoever we end up voting on. Yeah, and I think maybe if Gary, if you have a comment to that, I know that there can be priorities given, like in some cases, public safety, teachers, things like that. It cannot be targeted to one specific business, but there are some either subsidies or preferences that can be made. That's right. And so the town does have a policy in place currently for this type of low income housing for a very low, low and moderate income housing and how those priorities are given. But any policy would have to comply with the federal fair housing act and also the state fair housing act. And there's case law on how that works and how those policies can avoid discriminating on the basis of a particular group in violation of state and federal law. But it is possible to give some priority. Yes. I also want to recognize that uh, our town manager uh, in his report called out that one of the other topics that, that um, should be discussed is uh, cost recovery on administrative time. I think that was a, a good idea to add that in because, as you know, any of the staff for the jurisdictions will be called upon to help support uh, the, the conversations, and that will take you out of your office or whomever it is. So that was a good call out. Vice Mayor, any thoughts? Well, thank you. I forgot I get the last word, I guess. Um, I want to thank Visit Napa Valley and uh, Mr. Gregory so much. Please let him know that I said so. I think that um, Yachtville is already blessed with hotel properties who have recognized the need and stepped up to the plate and done a great job of, uh, you know, the Bartosano and the Hotel Yachtville. We're very proud of them and of our town. We certainly need it, and the idea that we could use this um, to put deed, you know, purchase properties and put deed restrictions into place in perpetuity, hopefully. Um, I, I'm thrilled by it. I was willing to raise my hand and throw it, throw uh, in my bid for um, doing this with you, Mr. Mayor. But I certainly support my colleague Carrie, and I think that uh, she'll do a great job. Is there a motion in there somewhere? Oh, Mayor? yes, I think there is. Just a moment. I would like to make a motion that um, we, um, how is the, the motion? Just scroll it. Oh, uh, that we um, appoint the mayor and council member uh, Dorman to the working group to work with the county-wide working group to evaluate the 1% TOT ballot measure for workforce housing. I'll second. Yeah. Okay, we'll do it verbally again. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> no, thank you. And thank you for volunteering. We'll let you know because the first meeting's in two days. <laughs> Thursday at 5 o'clock. Here in Yountville. So Here in Yountville, that's right. Commute. Thank goodness. Um, okay, so, yeah, Vice Mayor. Are, are those those meetings? Are they open to um, 
for example, if we wanted to just see what was going on? I think they have to be open to the public, don't they? Like the cannabis conversations were. But yeah, we can't so they certainly can be. The Brown Act. Say that one more time. You can't violate the Brown Act by having all of us there, you right? Yeah. A so third member could be there but not participate in any way. So if, uh, a, th if a third member. Not even. Yeah, no. if a third member's there, I, Sorry, I would okay. recommend yeah. just okay. doing an agenda. Just, You're not invited. Thanks. <laughs> so just to, so that there's no confusion, a third member of the council should not be right. I, I Correct. Think and the reason for that is the meeting's not generally open to the public as a whole. And so it, to avoid that okay. issue, to have a third there, it should be an agendized meeting. Or if there's only two from each of the jurisdictions, it's like any other two by two by two where you don't okay. have to do the agenda. Yeah. All right. And you need Working to group. avoid the appearance that three of you have agreed on what an outcome potentially could be that you would support. I understand. So let's, let's assume that we can agendize a June 5th uh, report out uh, because we'll need to. We'll have an item. We'll need to. We'll have an item on June 5th. Definitely. We'll probably have. There was a second date thrown out uh, originally. I don't know that that's firm. We'll find out, I'm sure, on Thursday, uh, a second date before our next meeting, at least a second meeting before our next council meeting. Okay, thank you very much. Next item, Council Emergency Preparedness Ad Hoc Committee. We've got another ad hoc committee, ladies and gentlemen. There's no limit to those. Oh, there is, but in this particular case, we'll get started. Um, this item identifies that the council had asked for a little broader definition of what the role of the Emergency Preparedness Ad Hoc Committee would be. So I, I, we've outlined a scope that includes basically the Ad Hoc Committee will focus on education and awareness with an evaluation and update of current town emergency preparedness information and processes evaluation and review of methods used by the town to communicate information including prior to an emergency situation and during because they're different um, also focus on information content for residents and business community so that they know what they need to do in the first 72 hours of an emergency um, develop a robust portfolio of information for an emergency preparedness page that would be housed on the town website and then we could also pull out of that and distribute various information at community meetings and events. Meet with our local fire EMS providers, county EOS staff, law enforcement staff, PG&E and town staff and other cities to learn more about what emergency prepared information content already exists and how to put that context and that information into place in Yountville and tweak it and adjust it uh, to be more Yountville specific. And then plan and host an annual emergency preparedness workshop event. Uh, thought would be one tentatively for the fall. And this could also include, again, some of the more focused description about these are the types of things likely to happen in Yountville. Here's what you need to be prepared. Here's where you'll find information. If you don't, here's what you need to do. Um, and then finally evaluation and discussion related to coordination of the role of volunteers from the community who might want to help in an emergency situation and <clears throat> um, generally what we'll be doing is uh, the town manager and management fellow will provide support um, this is a good in my opinion a good uh, education update where we can look at current information we have a significant amount but put it out and collect it in a way um, use the ad hoc committee as an evaluation is, is is this going to be well received by our target audience maybe we've got some really great stuff that staff really thinks a lot of and you all look at it and go huh and how do we make it work so we're, we're looking at this from a positive standpoint of how do we improve the communication and knowledge base so that our residents are, are better able um, to take care of themselves and their neighbors during an emergency and then what I would envision is the annual emergency preparedness event would continue you may be aware that the county is doing some similar type events probably a little less structured than what I envision I also envision that we would have our local responders I also think we might be able to talk about what the to-go bag look like what are some emergency provision content there's some catalogs and vendors that will come up so th that's what we have you would ask for a scope and then the second part of the equation would be if you establish the ad hoc committee to please appoint two members um, 
you have uh, Vice Mayor Dornbecker and Council Member Carrie Dorman in their previous communications to you have expressed their interest in serving on this ad hoc committee. Thank you. Any questions of the report? That's Mayor Moeller. Can you, um, <clears throat> we, you did start out, we do have a lot of ad hoc committees and some of them in the past has required, you know, consultants and a lot of staff time. Other ones, uh, you know, we kind of work off-site and or with our ourselves and then kind of bring the package to staff for you know comment and stuff what's your estimation or can you estimate how much uh, staff time you might be putting into this or, or how that structure might work um you know that's an interesting one to to phrase i would say i think by including the management fellow and some direction I think part of the responsibility would fall on the two committee members to do some of the research. But in all candor, we have a lot of this stuff out there, and a lot of it exists with our partners. So I think part of it would be several meetings to look at and then develop. A uh, management fellow can help craft it, put some of it out in the format. So I'm going to say it's probably on par with the Cannabis Ad Hoc Committee in terms of support. Um, or maybe the library ad hoc committee, but I don't see a need for an external uh, consultant or project. We'll be doing it in-house. So are you, are you saying that you think your vision is that the uh, end product will be a booklet, a pamphlet, and a seminar? Or, um, I or think that's... Something like that? What I would say is content that you could use as a booklet, and I'm basically thinking a lot of stuff that would go on the website, so we'd have a central repository for it. If you want to look at it there uh, and then you know because it could be winter seasonal stuff pg and e stuff so we collect it have it and then we may be able to develop releases that are more targeted you know winter season has this summer season has this or here's where to go and you'll find it all on our website you know if you're talking evacuation you know there's three or four things to think about so i i really think to your point, it's all of what you talked about, um, but it's not because I'm really thinking we, we want to have the home for the content be our website, but have the product be something that we can pull off and print to hand out when the situation might warrant. Because some yeah, of I, th I think things. you're talking about things that the ad hoc committee can handle, frankly. We'll get input from the residents. They're going to have good ideas about how to reach out to their individual communities. We know different platforms are needed for all types of communication so um, that I think is going to be part of the task of the committee also any other questions I just Mr. wanted to um, make note that both um, council member Dorman and I have signed up to take a training over four um, periods in June um, so the cert training so uh, we really want to you know educate ourselves so that we can help to educate our residents you might get to use a jaws of life on a beat-up car to pry it loose those are that's good training Prying down a building is more fun yeah any member of the public uh, we have one member of the public left do you want to see yeah <laughs> way to stick it out Catherine <laughs> thank you um, seeing no further uh, I'll happily make a motion to appoint council member Dorman and vice mayor Dornbecker to serve on the emergency preparedness ad hoc committee the only other guidance I would uh, request is you work closely with the county's effort because they do have things like early warning systems and communications and some of the things that will be pertinent um, so as you put your committee of residents together and just have that coordinated effort but I, I think uh, having the two of you on that committee would be very helpful to us. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. You voted for yourself. Good. No, no, uh, no voting. No. Very good. <laughs> that passes unanimously. Thank you very much, and thank you for bringing that forward. Staff informational reports. Do we have any? Nope. Okay. Last time I assumed none, then I was told we had something, so I want to check. Flood control, I basically covered it earlier when uh, Joe gave his presentation on the uh, Measure A wind down. We have basically a month left of that and uh, corresponding projects that Joe and, and his group will 
continues to monitor. That was the, the gist of that uh, meeting today. NVTA, Carrie, did you have any news from that? No, we, we meet, meet tomorrow. We meet tomorrow. We will meet tomorrow and report out on that. Uh, Waste Management Authority, anything pertinent? Uh, we are meeting on Monday, and we have a nice 187-page uh, new contract to review and comment on. They've uh, Their old contract had uh, 12 amendments, and so we're consolidating them all into one new one. And for Cal LAFCO, we met, uh, what is it, Tuesday, last Friday, and I just want to mention one bill that um, our local LAFCO, and we're trying to get as many other local LAFCOs to support as well, uh, and I do want to mention once more that Gary Bell is on our legislative committee, so he can chime in too. It's Assembly Bill number 2258. Uh, we went to, and it's actually something that... Um, um, Cal LAFCO is, is our first foray into actually doing legislation. We could only spend 20% of our time and money on lobbying, so we went to uh, Senator Cabrello, and uh, what this is going to do will be the first time that uh, we're asking the state to actually provide funding for some of, well, all of LAFCO's activities are unfunded mandates. So we're asking them for a small amount of money and this will be used specifically for uh, an activity that's uh, related to dissolution of districts that are inactive because um, we're being pushed with uh, some new modifications to CKH to get that done. But, you know, all these things require money, so we'll see how at uh, another thing to vote for. So you can watch for AB2258 uh, if... Uh, makes a November ballot but I don't I think it probably won't this year is that right or what what is your opinion so, I don't know yet. okay where there's a lot of it, it might so I'll keep you updated so that's uh, that's the main thing I wanted to report out from Cal Afco. thank you reports and announcements anyone vice mayor is leaning forward well I just want to make an announcement that it may is also watershed awareness month and I just wanted to bring that forward on behalf of the Watershed Information and Conservation Council. Thank you. I did want to recognize uh, all that went into the um, cleanup day. Um, town and others, our Upper Valley folks, uh, thank you for providing that service. Thank you, town. Thank you, us, for funding that service. Um, and also, uh, I know folks enjoyed the prior weekend with the... Um, yard sales so that was um, it's always something that's enjoyable in in May so just want to make sure there was recognition given there um, any other reports and announcements okay I believe uh, see our last meeting of the month so we will be having um, Memorial Day services I know the native daughters and sons will be um, having their event on the Sunday May 27th, May 27th at, at 1 o'clock. in the Pioneer Cemetery. It will feel different this year. It will be the first time that uh, Lee, is, Lee Hart is not there to, to represent the, uh, uh, the Minutemen, but w certainly he'll be there w with us in spirit. Um, also, there will be a Memorial Day service at the Veterans Home on that Monday. Uh, details to come. Um, we're hoping to meet the new administrator supposedly in theory starting in June um, with no other business uh, I would entertain a motion to adjourn in the memory of Lee Hart uh, to our special council meeting of uh, budget workshop on Tuesday May 22nd so moved second all in favor aye aye thank you very much good night <laughs>